Welcome to The Economy Magazine, I-24 News, where we take a look at the world markets and the global economy. I'm Natalie Ehrlich. Well, coming up today, Argentina's new president implements dramatic economic overhauls, lifting currency controls, which is expected to depreciate the peso as much as a third. And Volkswagen is still reeling from a massive pollution cheating scandal, but locals from the carmaker's hometown remain loyal to their brand. Let's start now with financial headlines. U.S. manufacturing numbers dropped in November in part due to a stronger dollar and spending cuts in energy. Still, the overall outlook on the economy remains promising, with data revealing consumer sentiment reached a five-month high in December. Personal income also rose for an eighth straight month. A strong consumers should encourage the Federal Reserve now to continue with its tightening policy next year, steadily increasing interest rates. Well, Asian stocks mixed Thursday with the Shanghai Stock Exchange leading losses at 0.64 percent. Tokyo's Nikkei fell 0.51 percent, but Hong Kong's Hang Seng advanced 0.44 percent. European markets traded in a flat range on Thursday. By the afternoon, London's FTSE increased 0.22 percent, but Germany's DAX rallied 2.28 percent, and then the French Kink also uh, fell 0.3 percent. U.S. markets also were ready for a higher open. Well, Portugal is hiking the minimum monthly wage up 5 percent in the new year. The current monthly figure stands at 505 euros and will be raised to 530 euros come January 1st. The country's labor minister, Jose Vieira da Silva, made this announcement on Tuesday, even though employer groups and unions had failed to reach a deal with their traditional bargaining process. Eventually, this new government aims to increase monthly minimum wage to 600 euros by 2019. Well, Russian President Vladimir Putin hosted the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi in Moscow on Wednesday. The two-day visit focuses on both economic and political issues. Mutual investment between the two countries currently stands at $11 billion. India hopes that figure will grow to $30 billion in another 10 years. Also at the meeting, a number of business deals will be signed, discussions on a free trade zone area, Euro Eurasian economic zone, boosting tourism and agro-trade between the two nations will be brought up there as well. Well, another report reveals a grim view on poverty in Israel. NGO State of the Nation reveals Arab Israelis and the ultra-Orthodox most affected by economic hardship. According to the report, the country's overall poverty and inequality rates are comparable to the OECD average. However, using disposable income, those rates are among the highest of Western nations. The center posits that the reasons for that divide are differences in demographic structure the relative size of the elderly population, and also different welfare systems. Mauricio Macri takes the helm now as Argentina's new president. Now, once the mayor of Buenos Aires, this center-right politician has promised sweeping economic overhauls, setting the stage now for steep depreciation of the peso. Argentina's new president, Mauricio Macri, celebrates his victory and his inauguration on the balcony of the presidential palace, and his supporters cheering and celebrating what they see as a new era of liberalized economics after 12 years of government interventionist policies. In these first few days, the new president has already launched his first reforms, starting with drastic reduction of taxes on exports, particularly in agriculture, which is an important sector in this country given its soybean and grain industries. I want to announce what I did this morning with agricultural sectors. Here we have to reward those who encourage the challenge of exportation, of investment, of innovation. That's why from today onwards, there won't be any more taxes on industrial exports in Argentina. Another measure taken up by Macri, the restoration of a free exchange rate between the dollar and the peso. Since 2011, outgoing President Christina Kirchner had established exchange controls to limit capital flight. As a direct result of Macri's liberalization, the peso tumbled 40 percent to 15 pesos per dollar. This may push inflation, which ranged between 20 and 35 percent over eight years. The decision, which some see as giving Argentina credibility in the eyes of the financial community, is also worrisome to many. I think it is counterproductive for the economy. Lower salaries, more misery. Macri has said that an austerity program is necessary to lift up the Argentinian economy. Still, he vowed not to cut social assistance programs and has even begun distributing an additional $260 million to the country's most vulnerable for New Year's. 
According to the World Bank, 30 percent of the 40 million people in the country live below the poverty line. And the situation is one that Macri blames squarely on the policies of his predecessors. We come after a decade in which we've lost competitiveness, as in very few times before, that leaves us in a situation of extreme vulnerability. Extreme. Extreme. The people of Argentina have high hopes for their new government and foreign investors expect much from a liberalized economy. One thing is certain, the coming years will see policies shift for better or for worse. On set now for an outlook on the markets and recent Fed moves, we are joined by Iran Peleg, Chief Investment Officer of Clarity Capital. Thank you very much for being with us. Pleasure to be here. Well, how are the markets responding now to this uh, rate hike? So um, generally mixed, I would say. Initially, uh, markets went down. In recent days, they've been going up a bit. Overall, I think, um, you know, I think there was hope or an assumption that, you know, the, once the Fed starts moving, that would remove actually a, a factor of uncertainty for markets. But the reality is that people immediately have moved on to focus on the next question or the next uh, uncertainty, which is really the future path of rate hikes. Right. And, and they, have they have indicated started. that they're looking to tighten further. How aggressive do you think that they're going to be in the next year? Um, not very aggressive. Uh, we can't see them tightening uh, too much, maybe an additional 50 basis points or so. Um, the U.S. economy has improved over recent years, definitely. Unemployment has come down. Uh, but still, I mean, it's not like uh, the economy is booming. Um, growth is not stable from quarter to quarter. Uh, importantly, inflation is still low. I mean, the, the Fed's uh, inflation target is 2 percent, and we're now on their most kind of preferred measure, which is the core PCE. They're at 1.3 percent year-on-year um, increases in inflation, so they're f still far away from their target. There's no need for them to be in a rush to raise interest rates at this point. And at the same time, I mean, we're also having central banks globally around the world, whether it's in Europe or in Japan or elsewhere, China, for example, reducing interest rates. So while other central banks are reducing interest rates, rates, it limits the, the uh, extent to which the Fed can be aggressive in raising rates because that would then, um, you know, strengthen the, the dollar a lot, which would hurt the economy. Right. And uh, interesting point here, though, there was a lot of controversy about this <clears throat> rate hike with some notable people like Nobel Laureate Paul Krugman here pointing out that the labor market was mm -hmm. still quite soft. What's your view? So I think um, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of merit in those arguments. Um, I think generally speaking, Probably the uh, Fed moved because, you know, it was more of a question of credibility. Um, they really have to move. I mean, they could have waited a couple more months. Um, it's true that the unemployment on the conventional measures has really come down. But if you look at the uh, level of participation, for example, in the in the labor market, then it really hasn't recovered to where it, where it was, you know, before the 2008 financial crisis. So that's just kind of one measure that you can look at and see some more of the softness that maybe is kind of masked when you're looking at the conventional headline uh, rates. Well, do you believe that the Fed's move was in line with the market? markets and its expectations? Yes, it was. I mean, the market was generally expecting the Fed to move at this point. Um, so I think it was, in that sense, it was pretty much expected. I think, interestingly, what, what um, it, it would be interesting to see what happens now, because now there's a big divergence between the Fed's own projections and the market's expectations for interest rates rising, where the Fed is projecting much higher interest rates in one year and two years than, than, than the market. It will be interesting to see how that is resolved. Interesting. So what should we be watching next in this next year? What does this mean for bonds? Look, I mean, I think b bonds, I mean, um, interestingly, well, interesting, or maybe n not that interesting in the sense that, uh, you know, the, the, whatever happens to with interest rates, I mean, bonds are not, you know, offering an interesting risk-reward profile. Yields are very low. Wherever you look, um, the two-year Treasury yield in the U.S. is around 1 percent. The 10-year is around 2.2 percent. You know, whether you think that interest rates are going up more or less, you know, a 2.2 percent nominal um, yield on a 10-year rate is not very attractive from an investment perspective, and that's before you take inflation into account, obviously. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Do very much appreciate it here. <laughs> now, moving on, we have another fascinating story for you on Volkswagen and their emissions scandal. Let's take a look. Christmas is in the air in the German town of Wolfsburg home of embattled auto giant Volkswagen. The car maker is still reeling from a massive pollution cheating scandal, but locals remain loyal to their brand. We've never bought another kind of car, only Volkswagens. 
There is no crisis, it's already over. In September, Volkswagen was forced to admit that it had installed emission cheating software into 11 million diesel engines worldwide. Since then, sales have stalled and the company faces billions of dollars in possible fines and legal costs. For decades, Volkswagen has driven Wolfsburg's economy, providing thousands of jobs. But the scandal has left it vulnerable. In response, the town hall was forced to freeze hiring and new investment plans. Clearly, some people are afraid about their jobs. But in general, the people of Wolfsburg are pretty optimistic they'll get through it. Uncertainty doesn't seem to have affected sales in the run-up to Christmas. And some retailers believe the scandal is sparking a sense of solidarity. Also meiner Meinung nach könnte das wirklich jetzt eine Chance sein, auch die Besinnung zurück, wir gemeinsam hier in Wolfsburg. I think this could be an opportunity, money staying in the town to support local businesses and not being spent in Berlin or Hanover or elsewhere. Vielleicht besinnen wir uns jetzt hier zurück und lassen das Geld auch hier in der Stadt, um das Lokale hier zu stärken. As well as launching a probe into the Volkswagen scandal, the European Union is now investigating allegations the carmaker misused EU funds. But as the company navigates its deepest ever crisis, its troubles haven't stalled the festive spirit at home. And now for the stories we didn't want you to miss, we are joined on set by our one and only Daniel Roth. Well, thanks, Daniel, for being with us. What did you bring today? Well, first foremost is Martin Shkreli, who was, the BBC reported, the most hated man in America for at least a period. He's the person who uh, raised the price of a drug, an important drug for HIV sufferers and for babies, 55-fold. Uh, he raised the price enormously. Now, he was arrested earlier this month, but not for that. And this has become uh, a big topic of conversation. He was arrested because he essentially took money from one place illegally, from a company that he was running, and put it in the hands of, uh, of creditors of his, people who were out looking for money that he had borrowed that he hadn't paid back. So he was kicked out of the company that he did this, uh, that he did this for. He started another company, and that's the company that bought the pharmaceutical, this old drug that existed before uh, that was up for sale. He bought it and hiked up the price, and everyone hated him for it. Now, there's a couple of interesting notes about this, though. One of them is that at the end of the day, he didn't do anything that that was uh, illegal. He didn't do anything also that pharmaceutical companies don't do on a regular basis. He just did it on steroids, as the uh, as the article puts it. Uh, so it's interesting to know. People are outraged, first of all, that he did it in the first place. Second of all, that he was arrested, and he was arrested for essentially stealing from Wall Street, not for stealing from sick people. Uh, and third of all, uh, people are, are sort of looking for some kind of vindication, and they're not getting it because at the end of the day, the system is set up. The whole pharmaceutical system is set up to do essentially what Martin Shkreli did. Uh, so is this, you know, when you really look at his case, he was the most hated man in America, but he's a dime a dozen at the end of the day. Yeah, it's actually very sad. It really reveals that in at least perhaps America, you can get away with cheating some of the most vulnerable people of society, but don't ever cheat investors, right? Yeah, that's at the end of the day, that's the lesson here. Uh, now, maybe better news coming from uh, Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, they're working out a way to not only charge people a congestion tax for driving in the inner core of the city, but to incentivize people to take bikes. They want people biking, they want people saving space on the roads and using cleaner, uh, cleaner technology, we can call it, but it's really older technology, it's people power technology. Uh, they're, so they're looking at ways of incentivizing by, for example, having the government give out credits to, for new tires for the wintertime, uh, for bike fixes. They don't want to give money necessarily. There was a test in France where they gave 10,000 government workers uh, 25 euro cents a day for every day that they biked to work. It didn't really help, though, and the reason a lot of people think it didn't really help is because free parking was still available. So people essentially said, eh, 
I don't need the 25 euro cents. I'll take the free parking and uh, and drive my car to work. Uh, so Sweden's really looking to incentivize the the biking culture by creating more than just little bits of money, but actual actual credits that make it easier to bike uh, uh, and sort of creating a circle of of industry around biking. The same way that actually the the auto industry has built itself up through roads and through gas stations uh, and sort of creating an industry around itself. So the idea here in this exemplary city is, well, let's try to create a biking culture around bikes. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for bringing these stories to our attention. Daniel Roth, our reporter here at The Economy magazine. That wraps up our show today. Do stay tuned here every day for all your global economic coverage. I'm Natalie Ehrlich from the Jaffa Port in Tel Aviv. Thank you for watching.